Hi everyone. Today is June 24th, 2024. I am still on my YouTube hiatus, so I don't know when you're going to see this video, if it'll be several months from now. I honestly don't know. But this video is a book review about a book that was on my thrift books wish list for almost a year before buying it. And the title of this book is Healing Practice or Healing Secrets of the Native Americans Herbs, Remedies, and Practices that Restore the Body, Mind, and Spirit. So, before I get into telling you the reasons why I got this book and what led me to this book, I wanted to say that if you hear a bunch of noise, this is why I'm so close to the camera. I don't know if you'll be able to hear me. I have obviously my little tripping smoke detector, which is way up high. I can't reach it. So sorry, gonna hear it. It's a little chirping song. I also have two fans blowing, the ceiling fan blowing, and an air conditioner blowing because it's been 90 degrees in St. Louis for actually not 90 degrees, like like 96 degrees for the past seven days, and it's been very hot. So if you cannot hear me, I sincerely apologize. I recommend that you put on headphones so that you can hear what I'm saying. I'll try to speak as loudly as I can. But before I get into why I purchased this book, what drew me to this book, let me tell you a little bit about the author, Porter Scheimer. Porter Scheimer specializes in health, fitness, and psychology. He is the former executive editor of Men's Health Newsletter and Body Bulletin from Rodale Press and has also worked as a journalist. His nationally syndicated column, Body Works, appeared in newspapers across the country in the mid-1980s. He is also the author of Keeping Fitness Simple, 55 Ways to Conquer Headaches, Body Shaping, 51 Ways to Stop the Pain, or Backache, 51 Ways to Stop the Pain. His articles have been published in Prevention, Reader's Digest, Ladies' Home Journal, Men's Health, Runner's World, Healthy Woman, and Organic Gardening. Scheimer is a graduate of Princeton University and lives in Emmaus, Pennsylvania. Now, I went on the first, I guess, tabs of the internet and Google, and I couldn't find a website for this author. Most of the information I found about him was already information that was in his bio in the book. So if you want to learn more about him, you can go do a search yourself. You might find more about him than I could find. This book was published in 2004, so it is 20 years old which is a nice age for a book. Now, the reasons that I selected this book and why it took so long is because over the course of 12 to 10 years, I've started to slowly develop an interest in learning more about Indigenous Americans. I honestly don't know exactly what to call them I'm going to say Indigenous Americans, but if that's offensive, I'm, I'm very sorry. I'll just call maybe Indigenous peoples. Some people say First Nations. Other people say Native Americans. Um, there's also the tribal names of, of them. However, I don't know if that's their actual tribal name or if that was a name that was placed upon them. I honestly don't. No. That's one reason that I haven't discussed a lot of literature about the indigenous peoples. Another reason that I haven't done many reviews or started studying more about them is because I didn't know who to trust or who to listen to. When I come across the subject of indigenous peoples in North America or in the um, United States or before it became the United States. I don't know who who to really follow 
because sometimes I will come across blatant lies and other times I'll come across factual information riddled with little half-truths and lies. So I honestly don't know. But as the years have passed, I've gotten this this feeling that I really need to study about them. And this feeling used to come once a year around the same season. It was usually near the end of summer, the beginning of autumn, and it would last from like late August or mid-August to October. And I would have this strong feeling in my soul that I really needed to learn more about them and I had this yearning like I was missing something but I didn't know what I was missing it just made no sense it made no sense to me another reason why I decided to get this book is because some of the herbalists from the past that I would follow and read about a lot of them had interactions with the indigenous peoples of America for example Dr. Christopher was colleagues with a Native American person. A lot of their recipes came from the indigenous Americans. I also am starting to research more about um, the relationship between the indigenous Americans and black people or people of color, melanated ones. I hear a lot of conflicting stories. I'm mostly hearing more from like Hebrew Israelites. I'm not a Hebrew Israelite or anything, but I know one of the things that they consistently say, since they say a lot of stuff, is we were the first. We were, we are the indigenous Americans. We are them. They are us. And, you know, looking at the pictures, I'm like, okay, I can see it. So I said, well, before I start reading books about that, let me just read about the medicines that they use. If they're my ancestors, maybe I can get more of a connection by using the remedies that they use to help heal themselves and keep in good health. Something that I would be able to understand and connect with on a physical level since most of them from the ancient past aren't here anymore unless I am one of their descendants. I don't know. So that is where I am right now in my journey of learning more about them. Sometimes I might interchange between using them and using us for this video because I'm still on the fence. Like half of me thinks I'm like, okay, yeah, I am them. Like, my ancestors were them. And the other half is like, well, maybe we just blended. I don't know. I don't know. But for this book, I'm going to share with you some of the information that really stood out to me that I did not know before. Some of the information where I had, like, I was like, oh, okay. I thought that, but now you've confirmed it. So let's start with the introduction. So in the introduction, the author speaks about how they used, how the indigenous Americans used nature as their pharmacy. It says they were on a first name basis with hundreds of healing plants, grasses, and herbs. Native Americans also recognized the healing powers within their own bodies and treated them with great respect. They felt that the power to heal was a gift entrusted to them by the Creator and believed that human power and strength came from Mother Earth and all living things. Native healers took an entirely different approach to healing. The best remedies in their view were those that empowered the body to take care of itself rather than merely providing temporary support. 
They also deeply believed in a spiritual component to healing, that prayer, visualization, and a variety of healing ceremonies strengthen the body as well as the mind and emotions, making recovery much easier. And when I read about that, it kind of reminds me of traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine or other forms of indigenous medicines around the globe where you didn't focus mainly on the problem. You focus on the entire body and it wasn't just the physical problem. It's like, is there something going on with you mentally? Is there something going on with you spiritually? Were you hexed by some witch? Is your ancestor angry with you? Maybe we should use some dream uh, workings to see what's going on with you. It was a whole body experience. Whereas modern medicine has taken the spirit out of healing. Now it's getting closer to bringing the spirit back into healing uh, by having, I guess, integrative medicine. It's starting to let acupuncture in and Reiki and different things in some places, depending on where you are. So we're slowly getting back to how we used to be. It's just going to take a, a little while. One thing that surprised me about this book was the amount of herbs that this, this author put in there. I honestly was surprised that they put as many herbs as they did. I also really enjoyed the references that they placed in the back of the bibliography. I went out and I was adding those books to my cart as well. Even though this book is under 210 pages, it was very informative for such a small book. I was, I was really impressed. Hmm. Many people are surprised to learn how sophisticated Native Americans really were. Often history presents these intelligent, intuitive people in a very limited light. Although it's true that Native Americans were gifted hunters, tool makers, and warriors, their gifts were more wide-ranging than that. Until recently, little had been said of their impressive talents as healers. The only thing about this book that truly annoys me sometimes, what the author does, no offense to the author, but I'm just, I'm just telling the truth. I notice in some parts of the book, the author would be like, even though they had very little knowledge of science, I'm surprised that they learned this or they were able to do that or they didn't even have knowledge of such and such a thing. I mean, just because they didn't go to medical school and just because they didn't have a degree in biology or use the botanical Latin name for a plant doesn't mean that they did not understand the science of the plant. They knew how to use it in different ways. If you see throughout this book, they would have different methods of healing. Some of the methods would be using animal fats or making salves or salves. Others would be like, you have to chew on this, you have to boil this. Of course, they had to have some knowledge of science if they know what form to use the herb in and when and where to put it on there. I feel like them saying, oh, they don't have any knowledge of science. I'm surprised they knew that. It's, it's almost like insulting them and complimenting them at the same time. Being like, wow, this primitive person didn't even know this. I'm surprised. That's the only part that really annoyed me about this book. Because it came up several times. I'm like, look, what are you, what are you trying to say? Are you still trying to kind of push like, oh, they were primitive. They didn't know any better. Okay. Among the early colonists, Native Americans were well known for seemingly miraculous healing feats. Yet historians who recorded few of these stories, probably because of racial prejudice and the belief that Native Americans were savages. Hmm. Still stories of Native American medical prowess continued to circulate by word of mouth and were recorded in colonial diaries and journals. Today we're able to read first-hand accounts from the earliest settlers about what the Native Americans were able to achieve. 
So here's some quotes from different people throughout history about them and their healing. So one is from 1650. Uh, it's a Dutch explorer, Adrian van der Dock, Donk. The Indians know how to cure very dangerous and perilous wounds and sores by roots, leaves, and other little things. Another quote from 1714 by John Lawson. Among all the discoveries of America by the French and Spaniards, I wonder why none of them was so kind to the world as to have kept a catalog of the illnesses they found the natives to cure. Then there's another thing where it talks about bathing. And I'm going to comment on that after I read this paragraph. These earliest inhabitants of the North American continent were far ahead of their time not just in their use of medicinal plants, but also in the way they lived. At a time when bathing was considered a dangerous practice, for example, the Native Americans would plunge into frigid water in the coldest weather to cleanse their body. That sounds like a hydrotherapy. Yeah, hydrotherapy. Hmm. They were strong and fit in their physical endurance amazed Europeans. According to one early account, these people are a robust and vig vigorous sort of a sanguine temperament, admirable complexion, and unacquainted with great many of the diseases that afflict the Europeans. Man, when I say I read this paragraph and I laughed so hard, there was another part where they also where the author mentioned bathing in another part, <laughs> and he referenced a Spanish queen that bragged that she had never taken a bath in her life. Now, mind you, common sense would say you want to be clean. Like your body won't feel that great if you're not clean, if you're dirty. You just have this natural human urge to be clean, you would think. Now, as far as it was a dangerous practice, I don't know. Maybe maybe in Europe their waters were polluted. I don't know much about their, their water. I mean, I've read some things in passing and from what I'm assuming, most of their water might not have been clean. It might have been parasitic. I don't know. I don't know what the um, the whole part of bathing being seen as a sin, especially if you had holy water. But I don't know. It's like Catholicism. I, I honestly don't know. And I think it's ironic that a group of people who it admires people like the Greeks and the Romans wouldn't take baths because didn't the Greeks and the Romans have bathhouses? So why why are you not following them? Another reason why the Native Americans or the indigenous Americans complexions were clear and all of that is because when you're bathing you're cleansing your body of germs. You're cleansing your body of just different things that could cause infection. You're getting the dead skin cells off of your body. If you keep these things on your skin, if you keep these dead skin cells on your skin, if you keep these germs on your skin, of course it's going to turn into a disease. Of course you're going to get sick. Of course you're going to fall prey to infection or worse. And it's crazy because no matter how rich some of them were, like think about Versailles. Versailles was dirty. Versailles, they're going to the bathroom in the corner. They're barely bathing. They're spraying perfume on themselves. But they're just relieving themselves in a corner like why 
what is this? This is insanity. So I can kind of understand now even better why a lot of the indigenous Americans passed away from the bioweapons of of missionary blankets. Dirty. Yes, it might have had smallpox and stuff on it, but then think, would I want to touch a person who's barely bathed or who bathes once a week? I ride the bus and the train. I, I know when to move. When... And I worked in the library, so I've smelled all sorts of human smells. You can't tell me that you, that you can stay sane and be dirty. Usually when I see somebody that's dirty or smell someone that's dirty, either they're dealing with mental illness or they are dealing with extreme poverty or they are too ill to take care of themselves or they're a child and they just don't know any better. But you, who thinks you are superior coming over here, you don't believe in soap. I don't know, it's just my pet peeve. Like, if you have the ability to bathe, if you have the finances to bathe, if you have the resources to bathe, why aren't you freaking bathing? Especially if you're near a lake. And this is just coming from a person that bathes twice a day. I just don't understand. (sighs) Okay. I'm sorry, I had to say that. (laughs) It's just like... Chapter 1, The Healing Spirit. The philosophy that underlies all Native American healing techniques, verbal, physical, and spiritual, is really very simple. In order to live healthfully, people must learn to live in harmony with the world around them. In a sense, the Native Americans were the first ecologists. They wanted their relationship with Mother Earth to be as harmonious as possible because they believed that only when they lived in harmony with Earth would they achieve spiritual peace which was essential to good health. This is a quote from Louis Mel Madrona, MD, Medical Director of the Center for the Complementary Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. When we are in harmony with Earth and the people around us, Our cells are in harmony within us. It's disharmony that creates cellular degeneration and disease. There's also something where it was talking about health as a family affair. And it goes into detail about the interconnectedness of human beings with nature and how the indigenous Americans looked at at all living things as connected. Chief Seattle wrote, Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it, such that whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. A lot of people sometimes become sick because they're outside of gratitude. They don't take the time to rest. They don't take the time to take care of the plants, the soil. They don't take the time to be grateful for the food that's in front of them. Everything is rush, 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 rush. Everything is take, 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 take. When people think of family, they only think most of the time think of like humans, other humans, or sometimes their pet. But family is everywhere. Family is the trees, it's the plants, it's that annoying squirrel over there in your roof. It's the little bumblebees and the insects and everything. Everybody plays a part. The worms play a part. The bumblebees play a part. Even that crazy screaming squirrel plays a part. Where's that? And they're a little screaming in the tree. 
they have a part two. The Native Americans believed that sickness was often caused by a bad relationship with certain aspects of nature. Although some types of injuries like snake bites and wounds had obvious causes, it was harder to explain internal illnesses. The Native Americans felt that invisible illnesses were most likely caused by the angry spirits of animals who were taking revenge for insults they received in life. An animal ghost will cause trouble if respect is not shown to its body after being killed. And also like showing disrespect like spitting on a fire could anger the spirits and result in illness. I think the way we harvest food and the way we get food in this country has a lack of gratitude. We never stop and say thank you to our food. We don't say thank you for your sacrifice. When we're harvesting a plant, we have to say, hey, thank you for sacrificing yourself for my nourishment. Thank you, plant, for the benefits that you are going to impart on my body and my family's body. Or I need you for this to help make this type of medicine. Thank you. But we just out here just picking a plant. It's like, get that dandelion. No, don't pick the dandelion. Don't just pick the holy basil. Like, ah, come on, holy basil. They're like, thank you, holy basil. You're protecting my home from insects. You're helping me to sleep. You're helping me to darken my hair. You're helping me to cleanse my face of acne. Thank you for all of the properties that you are giving to me of holy basil or Tulsi. Thank you. Thank you, Stake, for the sacrifice you made. I pray that your soul rests in peace. Thank you, Egg. You could have become a chicken, but you didn't become a chicken. Now you are the egg on my plate. You are giving me omega-3 fatty acids and different things. You are filling my stomach. Thank you for being my breakfast so that I can have a productive lifestyle to support my family. Like, the more gratitude you express for your food and all the things in life, the happier you'll be. Because you'll be expressing so much gratitude, you'll actually start wanting less. Like, the, super, or the material things become almost more superficial. When I started becoming more grateful for certain things, it was easier to give stuff away. When I started becoming more grateful for my food, I took the time to eat my food and actually enjoy my food. I'm around people who are always rushing. I'm around people who take the spirit out of food. They'll be like, oh, give me this powder, give me this and give me that. Like, no, take the time to thank this medicine. Like, you're not even thanking the medicine. You're not even like giving thanks for what the medicine's about to do to your body. If you're a person that takes vitamins, maybe you should try this ritual. Be like, hey, thank you powerful ingredients in this vitamin for the nourishment that you're going to give to my body to supplement me. I really appreciate that. And see how you feel after you've taken the same vitamin you've been taking. You're gonna feel a difference. It talks about spirituality and prayer, dream therapy, and shamanism, but that's going into a lot. So chapter two focuses on the spa, which I don't know if that's offensive to call it a spa. I feel like he could have used a better word. I'm currently reading another book about Indigenous Americans from the library, and the person, the author of that book, said that sweat lodge was an offensive term. It should have been called spirit lodge, but I honestly don't know if that's even the true term because the author was not Native by blood. He was a non-Indigenous American. He was like, like a white man but he got initiated into a lot of their ceremonies. So I honestly don't know 
if that is the full truth or not, because I do not know what they shared with him or if they shared everything with him. But I feel like to call it a spa would almost be offensive because it was more than just a spa, that you had certain rituals to go with this, songs, healing. I don't, I think it was more than just a spa, but okay. Even though Native Americans had great faith in the healing powers of the mind and trusted the spirit world to help them stay healthy, they were also star students of the body. They gained tremendous knowledge of such things as nutrition, massage herbs, and treatments with heat and cold. According to the U.S. Army officer in the late 1800s, the world owes a large debt to the medicine men of America. It is important to remember that Native American healing, like modern medicine, encompassed an enormous range of remedies and techniques. So one, one aspect they used was the healing power of heat. Give me a fever and I can cure any disease. That's what they say Hippocrates said. Many disease-causing microorganisms cannot survive at temperatures much higher than the body's normal 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The beneficial effects of heat were no surprise to the Native Americans either. They treated everything from arthritis to headaches within the sultry confines of specially constructed steam-producing huts known as sweat lodges. Sweat lodges were used so often and so passionately by Native Americans that Europeans attempted to ban them fearing they must house some sort of demon worship. So, you don't want to be clean, but you're mad at somebody else that wants to be clean. It's just like Africans or enslaved Africans with the drum. Oh no, they're communicating with the drum. You gotta outlaw it. Take their drum away. Take it away. Oh my gosh, they're using soap. Take it away. Take it away. I'm just like, y'all, <laughs> calm down. Why don't you go in the sweat lodge at the spirit lodge with them? You might get clean. You'll probably be happy. It is hard to imagine now, but bathing in any form was considered a sin by the Catholics and Protestants who lived in Western Europe prior to the mid-1800s. Bathing was so taboo, in fact, that one Spanish queen boasted she had never bathed in her entire life. The cleaner Native Americans knew better. They depend depended on their sweats, for both health and hygienic benefits, and also for spiritual rewards. Used by virtually all North American tribes, the sweat lodge came to symbolize a form of rebirth from the womb that offered a cleansing and regeneration of the body and mind. Hmm. I'm wondering, is this where yoni steaming originated from or did it originate from somewhere else or multiple places now i'm curious if they also use the spirit lodge for yoni steamings or if they had a certain lodge for women like was it was the lodge unisex was it um separated by the sexes that'd be interesting to know in the Northeast, sweat lodges were made of willow branches covered with birch bark or animal skins. In the Southeast, they often were dug into the side of a hill or made by hollowing out a large dirt mound. In the far Northwest, they were made of cedar planks and very far North, the Inuit even created sweats within the icy confines of their igloos. Early Native Americans didn't have electricity, of course, so they would heat rocks in a fire, then use leather tongs 
or the antlers of a deer or elk to carry them into the lodge. The lodge was sealed as tightly as possible, and sweet-smelling plants such as cedar, sweet grass, or sage were placed on the rocks. Finally, water was poured over the rocks, creating an aromatic steam. Members of most tribes took part in sweats at least weekly. Afterward, they would often dive into a cold river or lake, which completed the cleansing and invigorating experience. Natural springs were especially valued for such post-sweat plunges because their high mineral content was thought to have special healing value. And in the back of the book, it also lists sacred places that the indigenous Americans would go to. So if you are a person who likes to travel, you can get this book and basically visit those places if you haven't already. Even though early European settlers found Native American bathing habits odd, to say the least, they were as frequently astonished by the results. No duh. No duh. Wow, they're clean. Their skin looks amazing. Maybe because they got the dead skin cells off and show the new layer of skin off afterwards. Okay. Yeah, that makes so much sense. For a long time, no one was... No. Okay. William Penn, and I think that's the... Isn't he the founder of Pennsylvania? Or Philadelphia? Told one, one man, ill with fever and racked with pain, who followed a sweat by plunging into a frigid lake. Afterward, Penn said that the man seemed to be as easy and well in health as any other time. It also talks about sweats raising the body temperature um, above its 98.6 degrees, which helps slow or stop the progression of illnesses caused by heat-sensitive viruses and bacteria. And sweating also rids the body of certain toxins that the skin has been called the body's third kidney. Hmm. Yeah. That's just very interesting. I'm, I'm really loving it. It also talks about their nutrition in chapter two. So by chapter three, it goes into the healing plants that they used. A lot of the plants I recognize. Some of the plants I did not recognize other plants that I did recognize, I learned how to use them in a better way or a different way. So for example, there's one that I did not know I had come across. Somebody said, hey, do you have black haw? And I did not know until I went back to this book that black haw I believe was also known as cramp bark. And it's a viburnum prunifolium. And it's a an herb for a woman's well-being. Black haw contains a number of chemicals that have been proven to work as uterine antispasmodics or relaxants. So antispasmodic, it's like stopping spasms. The plant's ability to quiet cramps has been well established. Herbal authority James A. Duke, author of The Green Pharmacy, agrees. The bark contains at least four substances that relax the uterus, he writes. Black haw would be one of the first remedies I'd suggest to my daughter if she came to me complaining about menstrual cramps. Also, what I like about this section of the book is not only does it tell about the history of the herb, but it talks about the physical characteristics, what it looks like. 
where it can be found, and the methods that you can use next. So for black haw, the physical characteristics are it's a botanical relative of the honeysuckle plant. It grows as an erect bushy shrub 10 to 25 feet tall. It has dark green leaves, clusters of small white flowers that bloom in the early summer. It also bears small black or dark blue berries. It's found um, mainly in east from Maine to Florida. And you can use it as a tea. Yeah. So it's herbs like that. So let's look at some other herbs. Let's look at some herbs. We'll start off with like some that are common. And then some that I don't hear spoken about a lot. So dandelion. It's only recently that dandelion has been reduced to the status of a suburban pest. So it talks about like how people will take the dandelions out of their yard when they could eat, drink it as a tea. As a food, dandelion is hard to beat. The leaves and the roots were eaten raw or boiled. Highly nutritious, dandelion supplied Native Americans with goodly amounts of iron, potassium, phosphorus, vitamins A, B, C, and D. So now we're just taking a multivitamin and we're just throwing it in the trash can. That's very sad, but okay. They even ate the dandelion flowers, which are rich in lecithin, a valuable nutrient that has been shown to help a variety of liver problems. Dandelion is very rich in calcium and contains 200 milligrams of this mineral and 10 grams of dried leaves. It also helps with osteoporosis and has boron and silicon. It may be helpful in preventing Alzheimer's and it can help flush the kidneys and the bladder. Where it can be found, um, northern Canada all the way to the southern tips of Mexico. Early spring and late fall are the best times to harvest the leaves. So the methods that you can use it, you can use it in salads, you can eat it raw, you can boil it, you can saute it. Because the leaves do have a bitter note, many people add a little sweetening. Among the Pennsylvania Dutch, dandelions are often served with a dressing made from cider vinegar and sugar, and perhaps a little bacon. The roots are best when boiled or baked, and the flowers can be transformed into a tender delicacy, tasting something like mushrooms when pan-fried in butter or oil. I'm like, wow, okay. There's also Hawthorne, which I've spoken about before. Hawthorne was used for swelling, dysentery, and internal bleeding, but it mostly is used for the heart. This herb provides us with one of the best tonic remedies for the whole heart and circulatory system. It can help lower cholesterol, prevent the buildup of plaque on the arteries. It can also help with like high blood pressure as well. I help somebody lower their cholesterol. I recommended hawthorn berries and it lowered their cholesterol so they got their medication lowered too. The hawthorn tree is small, it grows 25 feet high. It's native to Europe and Asia, but it usually grows in more temperate regions in the United States. And you can use the leaves, flowers, and berries all in a tea. Yeah. Another thing, squawweed, oak, nettle, they use the nettle for joints. And you can also drink it as a tea, but for arthritis, 
you can bat the plant against the affected area, like like hitting the, the arthritic areas with the, the nettle leaf. It says, Native Americans didn't just swing metal, they would hit themselves with it to help relieve the pains of arthritis. They would take long sprigs and swat the affected joints, trading joint pain for the sting of the nettle's prickly needles. Some tribes boiled and ate the plants, which is high in boron. It also was used for wounds because it could help stop blood flow. It can help control internal bleeding and it's high in vitamin C and iron. So yeah, this, this whole section just goes in all these different plants. And another thing I really thought was interesting was how they would use animal fat. I'm starting to get more into animal fat. The only animal fats I really use on my face are emu oil, but I want to start using like bear fat if I can find it, um, maybe duck fat, because when I was coming across this book, some of the remedies they had were like this herb made in a salve of pork fat or bear fat and they would use it on their hair and they would use it on their skin and I was like hmm okay and it also made me think about pork how pork a lot of people are like oh it's unclean it's this is dangerous and I'm wondering if that's just what like Judeo-Christian religions and like, as I know, it's you can't eat pork in Islam. You can't eat pork uh, Jewish. Um, I'm trying to think. Hebrew Israelites, I guess. Uh, I guess they're under Judaism. I don't know about Catholics. I don't know if they can eat pork. They might not be able to. I heard of another person that's like Mormons. But I don't know really what Mormons eat probably Latter-day Saints, but is that just with Christian religions? If, if you know from the top of your head, or if you know better than me, just comment in this comment section below, like, is the anti-pork thing just with those specific religions, or is it in more religions than I can think of? But they were using pork fat and different animal fats for their healing remedies. The next chapter after uh, it talks about the herbs are different ailments that you can heal. So one is acne, and I'm using acne because I meet a lot of people that are suffering from it. An early Dutch explorer described the Native Americans as being sound of body, well-fed, and without blemish. At a time when Europeans considered bathing harmful and skin was nowhere near as healthy as it is today, many observers marveled at the Native Americans' clear complexions. So some of the things they used was sweating. The moist heat opens pores in the skin and allows them to drain. And this was with the, the spirit lodge or the sweat lodge. And you can create your own. You just you know got to be careful. Don't overdo it. Another is an herbal scrub, washing your face at least once a day with a decoction made from healing herbs such as aloe, fennel, rose, sage, watercress, or yarrow, will open the pores and help scrub away old oils. At the same time, herbal treatments help control the bacteria that can lead to acne. You can also um, rub the area with crushed fresh garlic. Another is cleanse your system, so like detoxing. Arthritis. You can use the sweat, like the sweat lodge. You can loosen your joints with water. You can use white willow, and white willow is like a natural aspirin. You drink it as a tea. You can use the nettle leaves, as I stated earlier. Another one. Hold up. Bad breath. 
kidneys, colic, colds. Hold on. Depression, licorice root. St. John's word has been getting a lot of attention lately as being nature's Prozac. But licorice, which was commonly used by Native Americans, is thought by many herbalists to be just as important. No plant has more antidepressant compounds than licorice. At least eight licorice compounds are monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which are compounds capable of potent antidepressant action. Purslane, a, a whopping 16% of the herb consists of antidepressive nutrients when measured on a dry weight basis. It contains magnesium, potassium, calcium, folate, lithium, all of which are antidepressant effects. Oats and scented herbs, so like aromatherapy. Huh. Oh my goodness. High blood pressure. It is, why doesn't it go into anything? It talks about black cohosh, garlic, onions, ginseng, plantain, purslane. Inflammation. You can draw out fluids by a poultice. Like uh, witch hazel. And you can stop inflammation from the inside. Memory loss, there's bee balm, peppermint, ginseng, and sage. So yeah, another one is um, after they go into, oh, hold on. The remedies, there's Appendix 1, which talks about Native American sacred places. There's Oak Creek Canyon in Arizona, Slide Rock State Park, Eureka Springs, Arkansas. I swear, I just finished reading about an inn in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. I think it was like Dairy Hollow. It was an inn from the 80s to the 90s, and then there was a woman and her husband. She's still alive, but the husband passed. A Crescent Dragon Wagon. They had an inn there, and they had, like, she had two books, so that's interesting. It's in Eureka Springs. This site was revered as a place capable of curing blindness and eye afflictions of all types. So strong was this belief based on the legend that here, the eyes of the blind daughter of a Sioux chief were miraculously restored to sight, that the waters of the spring were used by Civil War soldiers in effort to regain sight lost in battle. That's so sad. Mount Shasta, Kukui Hale Ele, and Waimanu, Waimanu, Hawaii. Then there's an herbal shopping guide. I did try to look up some of the stores, and I don't think some of them exist anymore. Internet resources. Some of these links are broken, but some of them are still being used. And a bibliography. So I actually had a very fun time reading this book. I did learn a lot. I'm sorry I didn't get, go into all of the details, mainly because I'm very tired. But I hope that you guys learned a lot about this and it inspired you to go out and learn more about the Indigenous Americans. My sincere apologies if I butchered any names, if I offended anyone. I sincerely apologize. I'm still on my um, reading journey trying to learn about the indigenous people, whether they were somebody else or whether they were my ancestors, I really appreciate the knowledge that they left for us to be used today. May they all rest in peace and may their spirit live on in Mother Earth. 
I give this book five fudge buckets. And I do recommend it to add to your herbal collection. I think that you'll be able to have some good results if you incorporate this into your life. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.